Hello and welcome to Sepsis Quick Check. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the editor of Critical Care Nursing Made Incredibly Easy. I hope to make this incredibly easy for you too. So let's talk a little bit about sepsis and how we're going to do a quick check assessment for our patient to determine whether or not they may be developing sepsis. First, a little background here. Sepsis is a potentially life-threatening type of infection that is going to stimulate the systemic inflammatory response. You can see there's a whole bunch of different ways that infection can enter the body and that can cause a patient to develop sepsis. What you'll find are very common types of infections that cause sepsis are urinary tract infections and pneumonia. Other types of infections like abdominal infections, maybe from a ruptured appendix or maybe a patient who's had a ruptured bowel, those type of conditions that can cause infection are also very prone to developing sepsis. Sepsis causes this out-of-control inflammatory response to occur. However, first we need to have a local infection. So the infection needs to start somewhere. And then that infection gets into the bloodstream and becomes a systemic infection. So that's what we're seeing here in this diagram is on the left-hand side, you have the lungs and the patient has developed this local infection in the lungs, some pneumonia. Bacteria gets into the bloodstream. Okay, but this is a very vascular organ. So bacteria gets into the bloodstream and starts moving throughout the body. As it does this, we're going to have an out-of-control inflammatory response. Inflammation is your first step in being able to control an infection. When it was just localized to the lung, we could localize that inflammation just in the area around the bacteria. But now that that infection has moved into the bloodstream and it, here it's showing bacteria, this could also be a virus or can also be a fungus too that is causing the patient to develop sepsis and this out of control inflammation. So as bacteria migrates to other parts of the body, we're getting inflammation there as well. Let's take a look at what happens then with that inflammation. Systemic inflammation causes three major conditions to occur. Now, even if this inflammation is local, so think about having a cut on your hand, you get vasodilation, capillary permeability, and clotting occurring. Well, hopefully we're getting clotting so you don't bleed to death. And then we have capillary permeability. You may notice that around that clot, around that cut, that you're having some fluid oozing out, that serosanguinous type of fluid. And then we have vasodilation. So you may get some redness and swelling in the area as a result of trying to increase blood flow to the area where the cut is so that we can hopefully heal it up and the patient gets better. So we start out with the vasodilation. If this inflammation is systemic throughout the entire body, vasodilation will cause a drop in blood pressure. Notice here that it's talking specifically about diastolic blood pressure. Now the reason for that is because the diastolic is a reflection of the vasculature primarily, whereas the systolic is primarily a function of cardiac output. So a little bit different in the way that they're manifesting. The patient will develop shock, and when you see this patient in shock, you see blood pressures that are like 80 over 40, 80 over 30, that really low diastolic pressure. Whereas if the patient was in hypovolemic shock, you'd see a pressure of like 80 over 60, a narrow pulse pressure. Next, we get capillary permeability. This causes edema, and uh, in the case of the lungs, we're getting capillary permeability in there. We'll get pulmonary edema, which will interfere with the patient's ability to be able to exchange gases. Next, we get clotting, which causes all sorts of little microclots, venous thromboemboli, and pulmonary emboli to occur. So you can see that this starts to become a systemic type of problem when it just started as a local infection. So what are the red flags to being able to determine whether or not your patient has sepsis? First of all is fever, so be watching the temperature. And in fact, when we're looking for sepsis in our patient, we're either looking for a elevation in fever or maybe even a decrease in body temperature. In some cases, the patient may not be able to mount a fever. And all this vasodilation that's occurring here could cause the patient to lose more heat 
than usual and end up with having actually a lowered body temperature. So be looking at the temperature. Is it out of the normal range? Altered mental status. So as this progresses, you notice there before that bacteria is going to migrate throughout the body, inflammation is going to occur throughout the body, and we're developing shock. All of those things are going to potentially cause a change in mental status. Elevated respiratory rate. The first organ system to be affected is the lung because it has a very high surface area. You know, all those alveoli have all those tiny little blood vessels going around them. Very high surface area. So we have lots of blood flow, lots of inflammatory uh, debris that is collecting there and that is starting to cause problems with gas exchange. Elevated heart rate. As the diastolic starts to drop, see, and we, here's a good example of how that diastolic might look. So rather than having what would be considered, quote, normal, 120 over 80, now we're at like 120 over 50. So you're seeing that diastolic drop, and you may be even watching the diastolic drop throughout the day. So you're seeing the 120 over 80, then 120 over 74 and then down into the 60s you're seeing that diastolic drop throughout the day that's a big warning sign that this potentially could be a patient who's starting to vasodilate that's an early sign of a patient who's developing sepsis it could also be a cardiac med so just be careful and then take a look at that too so the heart has to compensate for having that lowered blood pressure because the drop in diastolic or the vasodilation will also cause a drop in systolic since there's less resistance to pump against unless the patient increases cardiac output. So the patient will increase their heart rate. Remember that formula. Cardiac output is stroke volume times heart rate. So they increase their heart rate in order to maintain the systolic pressure. So as we have gone through here, you see on the right, the systolic is being maintained at least for a while. Eventually that systolic is gonna to start to drop too as the patient develops more shock. But watch the diastolic. That's your red flag, your key to finding a patient developing sepsis in the very early stages. Well, thank you for joining me for Sepsis Quick Check. Until next time, bye now.